Restricted stock is a common stock of a company that is not freely saleable. There are two categories of restricted stock. Shares that are unregistered, non-exempt stock is one category. Restricted stock A private placement, there's private placement rules at the federal level and at the state level that we will learn about the ins and outs of the private placement rules when we get to that applicable section. But the, the basics of what a private placement is, is it's the step before the company decides to have an IPO. It's before they file the registration statement with the SEC and sell the shares to the public. It's a way that the company can capitalize, but doesn't just sell to just anybody, but only sells to certain types of investors. It's called SEC Regulation D. So what it does is it allows a company to raise money by selling unregistered shares but that these shares are what we call non-exempt. Non-exempt means that they should be registered. So it allows the company to sell shares that should be registered, but they don't have to register them because of how they're selling them. So a private placement. So that's one of the categories of restricted stock. So we said restricted stock are shares that are not freely saleable. The second type of restricted stock are shares that were held by the insider of a corporation. These are what we call control stock. So the people that are insiders, they control the company. So controlled stock owned by insiders. So two types of restricted stock. There's a rule as far as because these aren't freely saleable, we must follow a SEC rule to sell these shares. Rule 144 is what it's called. SEC rule 144. It sets forth the holding period requirements, potentially holding period requirements, and the method of sale requirements for restricted stock. The holding period for a restricted stock of a reporting issuer. So reporting issuers are issuers that are required to file certain reports with the SEC is six months. The holding period for restricted stock of a non-reporting issuer is one year. So what that means is that if you own restricted stock of a reporting issuer, you can't sell it for six months. It's not freely saleable for six months. If it's a non-reporting issuer, the holding period is one year. Control stock does not have the holding period requirement. The holding period requirement is here for these private placement shares. Holding period. The private placement shares have the holding period requirements. Control stock, anytime an insider buys or sells their company stock, you got to be wondering, what do they know that you don't know? There's got to be something, right? So they're required to file what's called Form 144, and they're only allowed to sell a certain amount of those shares during the period of time in which Form 144 is good for. It's good for 90 days. So there's a, when you have control stock, when you're an insider, you have to file form 144 and you're limited as to how many shares you can buy or sell during the period of time that that form is good for. So publicly uh, accessible information, you can read about insider trades online or in your favorite financial newspaper. It's always interesting to wonder what it is they might know that we don't know. So restricted stock. Foreign stock. More and more today, 
the walls that separate the different countries are coming down. As an American investor, you can own stock that trades on a foreign exchange rather easily, much more easy today than it was even 10 years ago to directly own foreign companies' stocks. You do need to feel comfortable with, if you were to recommend this for your investor, explaining to them what kind of risks that they are exposing themselves to. They have currency exchange rate risk. They have political risk. Some domestic brokerage firms allow clients to trade internationally through one account here. Other broker dealers require them to set up an overseas account. How easy is it for your investor to access the financials of a foreign company's stock? It might be just as easy as domestic, or it might be in a country where the information is as readily released. Their laws, as, as far as their tax laws, might be different there. We talked about the FBAR filing that might be an issue for your client. On a risk spectrum, owning foreign stock would definitely be on the riskier side of things. Maybe instead of directly owning foreign stock, you get them into some sort of a global fund or maybe an international fund would be less risk than directly owning a foreign company's stock. Depending upon where you work, your company might issue you employee stock options. What an employee stock option is, is it is a call option on the common stock of that company. It's issued as a form of non-cash compensation. So my girlfriend works at Starbucks, and she has lots of Starbucks options. The issuance of employee stock options can be discriminatory. Most oftentimes they're offered to management members as part of an executive compensation package. Most employee stock option plans have vesting requirements as well as limited transferability. Companies that offer employee stock option plans, when they do this, one of the main reasons why they do this is to make sure that everyone that works for the company is really working as a team player. Because if they're working to manage the company well, then the stock price will go up and then the options that they could exercise once they vested in those options will be worth uh, more money. So it really helps to align the interests of the employees with those of the company shareholders. International investments may have a place in your client's portfolio. There are what we consider developed marketplaces, the United States, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, and Japan. And there are those marketplaces that we consider emerging. Emerging markets offer a greater potential for growth than the developed marketplaces do, but they also expose your client to greater risks. In order for an economy to become an emerging marketplace, it must have, have a stable government first. So the first characteristic of an emerging marketplace is a stable government, which is not to say that a developed marketplace doesn't have a stable government, because it does. But there's a test question out there that has to do with emerging marketplaces must have a stable government. So there's different acronyms for these emerging marketplaces. One of the most commonly used is BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Korea, so they won't test you on what are the emerging marketplaces, but that's an easy way to remember them. So riskier investments, you can make more money here. Developed marketplaces would be more conservative. Your client can also invest in foreign bonds. Bonds that trade in the foreign countries are denominated in those foreign currencies, just like the stocks in foreign countries would be denominated in those currencies and would subject your client to currency exchange rate risk, among other types of risks. So let's look at an example of a foreign bond. Let's 
Let's say you buy a British bond with a six percent coupon at par. So coupon rate is another term for the nominal yield. So that's a synonym. The coupon rate and the nominal yield on a bond are the same thing. So six percent of par. You paid par, so you paid a thousand pounds. When you bought this bond, the exchange rate was the pound sterling versus the U.S. dollar one sixty four. So UK, UK pound sterling, US dollar, 164. One pound converts into more than one dollar. Another way of saying the very same thing would be US dollars versus UK sterling pounds, 0 0.606622. Point six zero six six. So if this is the case, one dollar converts into point six zero British sterling pounds. So the dollar is weaker than the British pound. It will take you more than a thousand US dollars to buy this bond. In fact, it will take you $1,640 to buy this bond. So now you have a bond with a par value of 1,000 British sterling pounds. While you own this bond denominated in a foreign currency, one of two things is going to happen. The dollar is either going to strengthen or the dollar is going to become weaker. The test wants you to understand what would happen in either of these situations. If the dollar depreciates against the pound, when you go to exchange your pounds into dollars. If the dollar is now weaker, you're going to get even more dollars than you had originally invested into this bond, which has a positive effect on your return, which is kind of interesting. But if you think about it, if the dollar is weaker, that means that the British sterling pound is stronger. So when you convert back into dollars, you get more dollars than what you had originally invested into the bond, thus it increases your return. If the dollar had strengthened while you held this foreign bond, then your return would decrease. So if the dollar has strengthened versus the British sterling pound during your holding period, when you go to convert back into dollars, you might get less dollars than you had originally invested into the bond, adversely affecting your rate of return. Adversely affecting your rate of return. When you own a foreign bond, you have what is called an unenforceable claim. If the bond you had purchased was here in the United States, if the company went broke, you'd have certain rights as a bondholder. As a foreign investor, you lose those legal rights since you are not a citizen of that foreign country. Owning foreign securities, whether or not they're stocks or bonds, does help to diversify your portfolio. It does expose you to foreign currency exchange rate risk. Your client could own foreign government debts, 
we talked about foreign corporate debt. Sometimes you'll see a question on the test about a Brady bond. Back in the 1970s, it was the decade of the oil rush. Commercial banks had lots of money to spare due to the influx of deposits from foreign oil companies, so commercial banks began lending money to many less developed countries. By the 1980s, the price of oil began to drop. These less developed countries needed even more money, and so they borrowed even more. Many of these less developed countries found themselves in such financial straits that they stopped making the interest payments on their outstanding debts. Banks became unwilling to loan these countries any more money, and it was the beginning of an international debt crisis. Many commercial banks were left holding a portfolio of defaulted loans from these less developed countries. Brady bonds were created as a result of this international debt crisis. In an effort to restructure the debts of these less developed countries, the defaulted loans were converted into Brady bonds. Brady bonds were created in March of 1989, and they were named for the then U.S. Treasury Secretary, Nicholas Brady. Brady bonds are U.S. dollar-denominated bonds that were issued by mainly Latin American countries. Brady bonds were created with the help of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, with a U.S. government 30-year zero-coupon bond serving as collateral to ensure payment of the principal, so Brady bonds. A Yankee bond shows up every once in a while on the test. A Yankee bond is a bond denominated in U.S. dollars that is publicly issued in the U.S. by foreign banks and corporations. These bonds must be registered under the Securities Act of 1933 with the SEC before they can be sold. So a Yankee bond, it's issued by a foreign bank or corporation. It trades here in the United States. It's a Yankee bond. What's it denominated in? U.S. dollars. Investors can buy or sell foreign currency futures and option contracts based on foreign currencies, such as the Japanese yen, the British pound, or the euro. Importers and exporters will use options to help to hedge their currency exchange rate risk as far as if they have to pay in a foreign currency or accept payment in a foreign currency. They can use option contracts or futures to hedge their risks. Investment company securities, pooled securities. Pooled securities may include any of the following open-end investment companies, closed-end investment companies, unit investment trusts, exchange-traded funds, or real estate investment trusts, pooled investments. There are three types of investment companies under the Investment Company Act of 1940. I would know the three types of investment companies under this act. Management companies, unit investment trusts, and face amount certificate companies. Those are the three types of investment companies under the Investment Company Act of 1940. Mutual funds are a type of management company. All mutual funds are a type of management company. Mutual funds fall here. Of these three, only one of them has an investment manager or an investment advisor. That is the management company, just like you'd think. There's quite a handful of questions as it relates to mutual funds, which there should be. There are trillions of dollars invested in the mutual fund industry. Mutual funds are popular for some reasons that they'll ask you questions about on the test. Most of these you would know. So think about it to yourself, since I can't hear you talking. 
why are mutual funds so very popular? So over $11 trillion in assets under management as of 2010. Why? Why? Why do people like these? So there's mutual funds. We'll talk about open and closed-end funds. There's exchange-traded funds. Why? What do you have to know to get into a mutual fund? Nothing. You have an investment manager who decides what to buy and sell. So there's professional management. Are they easy or hard to get into? They're easy to get into. You don't have to have a lot of money. Some funds might have a minimum to get in, but very oftentimes they'll waive the minimum if you sign up for electronic funds transfers where you put in 50 bucks a month or something like that. So someone else manages the money. You don't have to have a lot of money to get into them. They offer you what? Diversification. So in your one share, you're exposed to all of the assets that are in that mutual funds portfolio. So you have broad diversification. Nobody shares any better than yours. They're all equal. It's the concept of mutuality. So diversification, that's a huge reason why they're popular. They're also guaranteed marketable. If you have a closed-in mutual fund share or an exchange-traded fund share, you just sell those at the next market price. If it's an open-end mutual fund share, then you would redeem those from the transfer agent. The transfer agent must redeem open-end mutual fund shares within seven calendar days. So it's easy to get your money out. You're either going to be able to get the next price which it's always forward pricing whenever we're purchasing anything. We never get the last share. We always get the next share price determined. It's always forward pricing. So questions here as far as mutual funds go and exchange traded funds, I'd say half a dozen probably, maybe a few less, depends upon your exam. Most of them are going to be around open end versus closed end funds maybe a question or two on exchange traded funds. So we need to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as this goes. So let's start off with an open end fund. An open end mutual fund is always selling new shares. Always selling new shares. So you have to always give out a prospectus when you sell an open end mutual fund because it's always in this continuous primary offering stage. Bid plus sales charge equals the ask. So when the customer buys an open and mutual fund share, they pay the ask price. When they redeem, they get the bid. So the ask, public offering price, same thing. Bid, redemption price means the same thing. So we have this, let's say it's a growth fund. And there's all of these different stocks and bonds within the growth fund. Let's say it's primarily made up of stocks because bonds wouldn't meet the investment objective of a growth fund. And there's money coming in and there's shares coming out. And there's money going in, meaning people buying shares. And shares coming out, people are redeeming shares. Um, money coming in, new shares coming out. It's this continuous offering. It's always new shares. And if you don't want your shares, they're redeemed from the transfer agent. And when you redeem the shares, you get the bid price. When you buy the share, let's say that the ask price was 10. The maximum sales charge allowed on an open-end mutual fund share is 8.5% of the ask. So the maximum sales charge allowed would be 85 cents which would mean that the bid was 915. If somebody bought a share today and redeemed their share tomorrow, they'd lose the 85 cents. It would never make sense to short-term trade mutual fund shares. It just does not make sense. So your client would not want to short-term trade mutual fund shares because you'd always be on an open-end fund that has a load, because this is a load, this is a front-loaded sales charge. They would always be losing money. So they pay the ask, they redeem, they get the bid. And when they redeem their shares, they the transfer agent rips them up, throws them in the trash can, and when someone else wants to buy a share, they get a brand new share. Nobody ever owns your share ever again. So it's this continuous primary offering. So the best price you could ever pay on an open-end mutual fund would be if... 
the bid was equal to the ask. If the bid and the ask were equal, then what you would have here would be a no load, a no load mutual fund. So no load means that they don't charge a sales charge. So some funds are no load funds. And then the other thing that some funds do, so we have this growth portfolio, this Within a family of funds, there's generally an uh, international fund, there's a growth fund, there's an equity fund, maybe a small cap fund, a large cap fund, a balanced fund, and then there's the bond funds that are on the safer side. And we'll do a risk spectrum later on in the course. But within this growth fund itself, the investor has the ability to choose different classes of mutual fund shares. There's generally three classes of mutual fund shares. So everybody gets exposed to the same portfolio of growth stock that's in the growth fund. But the difference between the classes of the mutual fund shares, class A, class B, and class C, is what's the sales charge. So if it's a class A share, it's typically a front-loaded sales charge. And if it's a class B share, it's typically a back-end-loaded sales charge. And when you have a class A share with this front load, it has low to no 12B1 fees. So there's this idea that there is a front loaded sales charge. So that's going back to bid plus sales charge equals ask. And when a fund charges a sales charge, they have no need to have what's called the 12B1 fee. So SEC has a rule about what are called 12B1 fees, 12B1 fees. These are distribution expenses that when a mutual fund doesn't charge a sales load, they've figured out a way in which they can create an expense, it's a percentage of assets managed, to reimburse themselves for the distribution expenses associated with the share without calling it a load. So it's kind of a misleading thing because when you pay a load, you pay the load once, either when you bought the share or redeemed the share as the case may be. But when your share has a 12B1 fee, that increases the operating expenses, which decreases the dividend, which decreases your yield for as long as you own the share. Because 12B1 fees are an annual operating expense of the fund. So when you have a front-loaded sales charge, generally speaking, you're going to have low to no 12B1 fees. But when you have a Class B share, it has a back-end load. And generally what happens over time is the longer you own the share, the lower your back-end sales charge would be when you redeem the share. So that eventually it goes down to zero. But if you were to redeem your share, you'd have a sales charge if it's during. You'd have to read the prospectus. But if it's during the first five or seven years, as described in the prospectus, you have a back-end load. And the Class B share is going to have the highest 12B1 fee. The highest 12B1 fee. So that when you have a Class B share... Once you hold it long enough, it'll automatically convert to an A share, which is really important since the A share has the lowest to no 12B1 fee. So remember, the 12B1 fee is an operating expense of an open and mutual fund. Who pays for the 12B1 fee? Ultimately, it's paid for by the shareholder. Ultimately, it's paid for by the shareholder because it affects their dividends. And then the Class C share, it's kind of like, well... It might be front-end loaded, it might be back-end loaded, it has a middle-of-the-road 12B1 fee. So generally the question is fairly straightforward, how are these different? They're different in fees. They're different in fees. And then if you have never read the prospectus for the mutual funds that you are going to be recommending, I urge you to do so because the information that's presented in there will help you understand the concepts that you need to know to pass this test. So there's more homework. Read the financials and read your prospectus. In addition to studying the practice questions, it all helps. So an open-end mutual fund, bid plus sales charge equals ask, or it could be the case that bid equals ask. But the only way that you're ever going to find that 
the asking price of a mutual fund share is less than the bid price, is if this share trades in the secondary market. And what that is, is a closed end mutual fund. Closed end mutual funds are sold by intermediaries in the secondary market. So what they do is they capitalize once. They bring the money in once, and then the shares themselves trade in the secondary market. And who determines the price in the secondary market? The market does. So the only way you could ever buy a mutual fund share with the ask price less than the bid would be if it was a closed end mutual fund. Back to open end funds. As the mutual fund shareholder, here's the portfolio of the mutual fund, and it has, we said growth stock, because that was which one we decided to get into, growth stocks. And you have a share, you have this piece of pie, if you will, and your piece of pie is equal, everybody's is equal, nobody's is better than yours, the concept of mutuality. And when you bought your shares, you bought your shares when the bid was 915, the sales charge was 85 cents, and your ask was 10. What's your cost basis? Your cost basis is what you paid for the share. In this case, $10. When you buy an open-end mutual fund share, the ask price includes the sales charge. But watch this. When you have a closed-end mutual fund share, we have bid and ask. When the client buys the share, they pay the ask price. But they pay the ask price plus a commission. That's different. So be careful. Exchange traded funds would be the same thing. Ask plus the commission. So when we have open end shares, it's ask, which includes the sales charge. But closed end fund shares and exchange traded fund shares, which are generally indexed, Mutual funds, exchange traded funds are generally mirroring an index. They're generally not actively managed. Ask plus commission is what your customer will pay. Ask plus the commission. So back to the open end fund. So with the open end fund, we paid 10 ask. And Bid 915. This portfolio is going to make income distributions to the clients. And the income distributions are going to be two different things. There are dividends. So dividends are paid to the shareholders at most quarterly, just like a common stock, at most quarterly. And the fund is going to make at most one time a year, one time a year is all they can do this, a capital gains distribution. A capital gains distribution. These distributions will show up on the mutual fund shareholders 1099 the dividends and the capital gain distributions, because depending upon the situation, they might be taxed in separate ways. Different ways, they might be. It really depends upon the current tax laws at the time of the distribution. So when you have a mutual fund share, you get a 1099, and that shows you what your income distributions were. And as the mutual fund shareholder, you can do two things with this income distribution. You could take these in cash, or you could elect to automatically reinvest. And most investors are going to choose the latter of these. They're going to choose to not take the check in cash, but to leave the money in the mutual fund. They'll automatically reinvest. Does that mean that they avoid having to pay taxes? Don't you wish? No, of course not. 
the income distributions are taxable in the year of the distribution, no matter what. No matter whether or not they took the money in cash and went and bought new skis with it, or they left it in the mutual fund, the income distribution is taxable in the year of the distribution. For example, let's say that the 1099 said that the dividends that were paid out were a dollar and that the capital gains were 50 cents. The test wants you to realize whether or not these are taken in cash or automatically reinvested, that the income distributions increase your investors' cost basis. So we originally paid $10 to buy the mutual fund share. We automatically reinvested $1.50. We have a cost basis at this point of $11.50. That's really important that you see that. I don't know how many people do this, but I'm sure a lot of people forget that that increases their cost basis. And then they pay taxes on that income distribution twice. And I don't know very often that the IRS writes a letter and says, you sent us too much money. I'm sure they do sometimes, but not very often. So we have a cost basis now of 1150. So if you sell the share when the bid is Say you sell the share when the bid is $12.50, the sales charge is a dollar, and the ask is $13.50. When the investor redeems their share, what do they get? They get the bid. How much do they owe taxes on? In that example, if you're following, just a dollar. Because we originally paid $10, the ask price for the share, we automatically reinvested the $1.50 in the income distributions, which increased our cost basis to $11.50. When we sell the share, we, we redeem it, we get $12.50, we owe capital gains on the dollar. So be very careful that you pay attention to that. Automatically reinvested dividends and capital gains increase your cost basis. They increase your cost basis. If you held the mutual fund share for a year and a day or longer, this is taxable, this dollar is taxable at long-term capital gains rates. If you held the mutual fund share for only one year, then it's taxable as ordinary income. So one year or less, taxable as ordinary income.